In China, the consumer perception about mobility is changing. There's nothing more exciting than to watch history being created, to witness the pace at which change is possible. The revolution of AI is not going back. Never going back. Yeah. This will be the new chapter, what we are writing in our history. What can we do that's fundamentally different with those technologies? I mean, that's, a, that's the multi-billion dollar question, right? It helps everybody to transform. Because if you do not do that, you're going to be in trouble very quickly. And the exciting thing about a car is that it's not a phone on wheels, it's a robot. The next chapter of automotive history will be written in China. The time I joined Bosch, which was 2010, at that moment everybody still believed internal combustion engine will last forever. But since changed so rapidly. EV wires is very different from five years ago, these customers. At that time, these uh, early adopters, but now so many mainstream people already get onto the, your showroom and saying, okay, shall I buy your car? In 2020, Chinese brands held 36% share of the market. In the first four months of this year, they have 61% of the market, a 25 percentage point swing in just over three years. How did that happen? They're focusing on the technology and they're able to focus on the technology and say, that's an area that, that we can and should differentiate. I think the whole um, revolution was triggered by uh, Tesla, but the Chinese automakers was react very quickly. So they started to develop uh, the uh, EVs and also PHEVs. Chinese government also played an important role. The government has a very um, uh, long-term target for five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. And also at the same time, they give the subsidies to promote the technology they believe that's for future. The public sector having a role to play in bootstrapping the reimagination of an industry or the redefinition of a paradigm of how transportation should be consumed, the government does have a role in that. They just put in motion a set of targets and appropriated investments toward creating the, the incubator within which a birth can occur. What is different in China is that the intelligent connected vehicle is the fully fledged manifestation of what a car as a smart device really is. We want to create this more of a smart home experience inside the car. You know, it's your personal doorman and also it's your personal driver, uh, and it's your personal butler. And all these things are all integrated together as one for the Robocar. We see a lot of uh, high-tech company uh, join the race. We started introducing the connectivity to the vehicles, and then people looking at high-performance chips, trying to make the vehicle smarter, uh, more intelligent. I think they have some unique partnerships that they're they're standing up with, with Baidu and Xiaomi and, and those, those types of you know, kind of pure tech players. Xiaomi, Huawei, their company, because they come from the uh, cell phone industry, they have a, a huge ecosystem to utilize intelligent doorbell, intelligent television, yes, refrigerator, intelligent cell phone pad, everything, they can connect everything to the car. Since the online video, social, you know, internet and music, entertainment, navigation already dominated by few players and everyone doing the in-car infotainment. So for the Chinese OEM, they can easily partner with one of them to develop a good enough product at a very fast pace. Internet companies step in and say, I'm gonna invest, and they did, in big way. Xpeng is a big investment of the Alibaba ecosystem. Neo is a big investment of the Tencent ecosystem. I want interoperability between platforms. That's internet way of thinking. 
this is what became the gravitational pull from the internet economy to get into the mobility industry. Mobile phone success definitely boosted the automotive segment as well, for sure, because mobile phone was the first device that has that kind of growth for almost a decade. The compute and the complexity of the chip it was basically improving dramatically almost every year. You know, if you look at the technology revolution, actually every time there's a revolution, what happened underneath it is you have a new chipset coming out. So almost all the new chipsets, the first release is in China. It's like you put a server into the, into the car. It will become the strongest computer in your home. 2021, two chipsets of there. One is, you know, um, 8295 uh, Qualcomm. Um, and we also have uh, Orion X from NVIDIA because this high, you know, um, performance chipset can empower those AI capability. Because previously we cannot do it. The, the cockpit GPU or CPU is catching up with the smartphone. The first time, first time ever. All the cars look pretty much the same as they have throughout history. On the inside, it's a totally different user experience. The interior of the cabin matters so much to them, right? Whereas traditionally we've been in the U.S. have been much more acceleration, horsepower, look and feel. And, and the interior mattered, but it was more of a convenience. If I can get my music to play, like I was kind of happy. That's not the case of where the, the Chinese consumer is at. And it, it's funny today, engines and transmissions are almost the, the commodity. You know, are they quiet? Do they give good gas mileage? Do they respond to the throttle? Yes. And um, once you get there, the new buyers are much more interested in the rest of the vehicle. We wanted to create a car that delivers the best user experience. And then we pinpoint some of the key user experience that's going to make customers feel like, wow. Especially the, the Chinese customers spend a lot of time in the car just waiting there and they want to be entertained. Now, karaoke is a very popular hobby for uh, Asian market. Everybody likes to get in one co-sharing space and be able to sing karaoke. We integrated uh, the industry's very first panoramic driving video game uh, experience. So the Relax Mo is a fully uh, immersive space that has multiple environments. You can see either at a forest or at a beach or at a bonfire, the more you drive this car, the more you can never go back to a traditional car. This display is not a window into the car. It's not a replacement for knobs and switches. It is a window into a whole new world and a whole new set of opportunities and a window into the company that you wouldn't otherwise have. When I talk to my friends, if you want to buy a car, what, which feature? Well, you to pay the most attention to. They love the intelligence. The intelligence will be the most important feature that they will consider. AI will certainly play a big role uh, in the automotive industry. Uh, even from the development stage, you analysis of data, automatically generate the software code, and also to train the autonomous driving uh, models. So we have this whole technology called the Omniverse. You can pretty much have a digital twin of your whole factory. Uh, basically, you can design vehicle and manufacture a, ve a vehicle in a much more smarter way. The ability to test, certify, build with quality manufacturing processes, I think all of that's going to be touched by AI. So ultimately, you get a higher quality vehicle that lasts longer that you can upgrade easier. Even in the car, we'll see the AI can be a good interaction between driver and vehicle and environment to provide a convenience from the infotainment standpoint. 对，甚至我们在开车的过程中，比如我现在来到上海，我在开一辆我自己的车的情况下，我路过上海所有景点，我都可以问这个车，这是什么地方？它有什么？值得我去玩的地方？那车的 AI 通过它的整个环境感知能力，比如车的摄像头。就可以精准地捕捉到当前路段的一些标志性的建筑，同时给到我一个需要的答案。Just say, hey, do you want to have a look at the restaurant? There are、uh, some free seats, and they get a good rating for the burger. Do you want to join? Should I do a reservation? 
starting from like a niche function, like something for fun, it becomes a more and more like a tool that people rely on. The last 100 years, we were focusing on making cars more safe, more efficient, having better design, ensuring the quality. Now with the software-defined vehicles, and especially with the AI, we have the unique chance to bring some soul to the car. The most uh, direct feeling customer can get from the AI that can start with a voice control area. You can more like this kind of natural response, a dialogue with the system. How do you do the human interface design there? Right? When you're in a vehicle, what do you need to see? Where do you need to see it? What's the interaction model versus this sort of interaction model, right? I actually think this is the number one issue in the industry, user interaction. And that's what Apple was really great at. They used this phrase, which is, it just works, and recognized how deep the work has to go, how much refinement there is, how much iteration, how much slaving over it, so that at the end, it's kind of inevitable. And the customer says, well, of course it works this way. Why would it work any different? So CMO is the AI that, that pretty much do all the interaction with the, the user. I don't even feel like Siri can give you that kind of conversation at all. Uh, Siri is more of, I give a command and then just give me a very, very specific designed response. Where CMO can constantly give you very, very uh, dynamic response, like a human conversation. The car has to have life, it has to have a name, and even it has to have a, an avatar or a face. Nomi is the avatar of the car that is representing the soul and the relationship between the car and the user. Many people who work in automobile industry start with the functions, start with the features and performances. But actually, we started with the relationship. The first question we ask is, what will be the long-term relationship between human being or between a user and an automobile? Is it a car? Is it a transportation? Is it a horse? Actually, we all felt it's more like the horse direction because we feel that the relationship between human beings and uh, horses is actually quite fundamental. It's not just purely functional. They have connection. They have this emotion. That's actually where the Western OEMs are already really strong, right? Like when you look at you know, a company like, like a Ford. Bronco is a very emotional vehicle that they can build off of. Explorer is an emotional vehicle. Mustang is an emotional vehicle. F-150 is its own brand in and of itself. We want to make passion products. People still are emotionally connected to their vehicles, even in the digital age. You can simply ask Simo to say, hey Simo, write me a 300 word essay talking about um, how to be a car designer. And the ChatGPT like which we use is the Ernie bot, uh, powered by Baidu, can suddenly give you all the answers through our CMO AI. At the same time, you can generate visual images like the Mid Journey. Say, hey, draw me a spaceship, draw me the future uh, concept car, or draw me a alien. Real time, it gives you all these uh, pretty much requests that you need. Uh, it can all be done through the robo car. When you're approaching the car, you no longer need the traditional plastic door handles. You can just simply say, open the door. And autonomous car always see it as the first version of uh, mass-produced robots. Everything moving will be autonomous. The beginning of really the physical AI. We can see it, right? Um, the biggest wave of innovation is really about making the car drive itself. Because we believe that's going to that's gonna give you more free time, more free space. And everybody loves freedom. Right. You don't need to focus on the traffic, you just can relax and experience the entertainment in the car. We know the different person have the different need. So how to make the autonomous driving function can adapt to different needs? Maybe it's mom drive with a baby. So she wants this car will be driving safely. The whole AI system is like, it's like egg and chicken thing, right? If you don't launch a large number of cars and start getting data back and start to train the algorithm, you won't be able to improve your AI algorithm. So it's like an egg and chicken thing, right? It's a smart EV which keeps evolving. With software updates, we can custom to your needs, to your habits. You cannot believe how this cloud-edge computing resource in China have like, you know, millisecond 
levels delays, you are able to also leverage the literally infinite computing resource on the cloud. In five years, we're going to be at that cusp of turning the driving function over to the machine within five years, here. But when that happens, shift our society in such a fundamental way, a car you will just become a moving office and a moving living room. The question is, does the Chinese tech idea translate to the non-Chinese markets? That's a steeper hill. That's a steeper hill. All the OEM has to plan uh, the adaption of their technologies into different regions because the end users are looking for different things in different countries. It's so astonishing where we see in the Nordic countries, actually Nomi should speak a little bit more harsh because the language itself is actually quite straightforward. But in other countries, for example, like in Germany, uh, where we brought actually the way Nomi speak in China, where people feel it's a little bit too young. So those kind of feelings are actually very subtle and we need to deep dive into those countries and understand the user better and use software to customize to those differences. So when I think about software, again, it makes it even more challenging to build a common set of interfaces and a platform that lets you do features, but also customizations as needed in local markets in such a way that you don't end up with 50 different vertical stacks, which is impossible to maintain. Automotive is a global industry, right? For any established brand, they should be global. And um, for most of the reason, they will partner with local partner. Different regions have different regulations, right? Different ecosystem partners. I think Chinese OEM still try to leverage some of the asset and know-how from China, and uh, but provide a tailor-made regional solutions. Creating something that's outside the norm generally comes from a tangential direction, right? A startup, a Tesla, a BYD, a, a NEO. They come at the problem with a different mindset, and you need that inspiration in order to reimagine. But when they do that, they don't necessarily win in the end. We have too many manufacturers. You know, the consolidation of industry is well expected. Eight years ago, there was more than 100 bands. Now the survivors only 30, 30 survivors. Many OEMs already went bankrupt in the past eight years. Their business go up, then go down and crash. Yes, a fierce competition market. In China, automotive industry, we're in the middle of a price war, right? Because we see the NEV already account for 50% of market share. Leading player, Tesla, you know, BYD, try to lower down the price to conquer the world. Uh, which is good to customer to a certain extent, but to be honest, not so good for the industry. It's not sustainable, so this is short term. 15 of the top 20 electric vehicles sold in the world are made by a company that was making a gasoline-powered car before they started making an EV. The only startups on the list are Tesla and Auto. That says, Legacy matters. A, a blank page is a gift, and uh, we don't get to start there, and the other established OEMs don't. And we have to figure out how to take 120 years of, of history and make that a strength and not a liability. You are still having to manage the legacy side of things while also trying to figure out what our next generation architecture is and doing that purpose built you know, solution. The challenge is still, you know, they almost have two separate teams to some degree working on it, right? Of where do I want to go in the future, which is their next gen architectures, and how am I you know, plugging the holes in what I've had traditionally to, uh, to stay competitive? The SDV actually changed the, the supply chain totally. Before, uh, we have the pretty vertical supply chain. Now we have all the suppliers more play like uh, partners. Make the relationship more healthy and more lifetime scalable. So they can actually use our platform to develop the applications and integrate what they use to integrate themselves and now onto our platform. So we also need to make this system to adapt to the different OEM's demands. So its request is need to be modular designed, very flexible, so that you know, the different OEM can tailor the system as they wish. 
。其实据我了解，很多传统的硬件型的 T L Y， 呃，当然可能是受受限于整个中国新能源汽车的发展，它已经变得更加的开放了。像，嗯、呃，我了解，像原来很多国外的大厂商，比如说做空气悬挂的，其实它以前是一个黑盒交付的状态，你厂商不能对它的呃能力做任何的定义和修改。那但是中国市场对这个呃需求非常强烈的情况下，那它就迫于目前中国的供应链的发展情况，它也不得不做出类似的一些改变，来提升它整体一个竞争力。I think it's also a little bit of that like build versus buy. You have to say like, is that something that I can do better in house by owning it? I think as well with partnerships, though, you also get a technology multiplier. So let, let's take an example of cloud. Like, I don't think it's in GM's interest to go off and build a giant. Global cloud service, right? Why would you do that? Instead, you partner and you can leverage that sort of thing. You're really looking at how do I bring that in so that I'm not having to reinvent the wheel. How do I make those individual components as robust, as powerful, as streamlined, as efficient from a power standpoint as possible? Share those components across, you know, multiple OEMs, multiple suppliers, and then it's about how do you bring those pieces together and build them into the. Into the, the software architecture that works for you. A lot of suppliers say, "Well, I'm going to offer a system solution." That is a very difficult problem to solve. There hasn't been an industry standard that's really evolved on the full system, and it is very, very hard to design one that is going to work for the industry. The bottom is the hardware, the chip. Then goes to the top is the solution in the cloud side. So you cannot truly do everything by yourself. You, you cannot. Because the investment and the return will be disaster if you try to do it this way, right? You should let the chip come to the chip, and you can customize with them. You can do the low-layer software together with them, but you should not do a chip by yourself. And it's more like an orchestra. You may have the OEM as the conductor over there, but all the players follow the conductor to generate a beautiful music. The big uh, innovation is still coming. Uh, the um, better and the stronger AI are keep coming to keep the technology uh, competitive. You have to also look, uh, look ahead and make sure you don't make, miss the big train in terms of being able to get to the uh, next generation of technology um, when Revit's ready. Two years from now, right? Everybody will use an AI phone. And once that happens, start from your phone can impact what you, you know, your use, your your behavior in the car, and that's gonna be, happen gonna be really fast. Two years from now, we should be inspired by it, not rejecting it. We should say yes. There's proof here that consumers will accept a vehicle with those features, provided it's a reasonable price point. If you understand that the future product spec is a electric. Must be electric. There's no debating this, and connected, device-oriented platform. Then you better build up the talent pool to be able to build that kind of car. If you want to change the world, this is a way to actually change the world in terms of reducing accidents, or in terms of just fundamentally changing, you know, how we are transported, particularly in cities. That is an industry-changing dynamic. It's a society-changing dynamic. This industry never, you know. Tired of innovation. This is a never boring industry, right? You know, automotive industry is by far the biggest GDP booster in China, right? The car industry in the past thirty or forty years, actually, the way people making cars are relatively stable. And now, what we are now doing that is we are solving the new problems nobody was facing before. So it's something you can do in the internet companies. You can also do here, maybe in a more direct and more sexy way. But People have an awareness now that this inflection point is happening, right? And even if they don't, I think it only takes maybe a minute or so to explain why it's interesting. When they're like, "Oh yeah, I didn't realize that was that level of complexity," but as an engineer, when you think about it, you're like, "Of course it is. Yeah, why didn't I think about that?" We are building a global team. We have offices in Silicon Valley, Cambridge, UK, Munich, Germany. It's just to. Trying to hire the best people in the world. We're in Israel. We're in China.、Um, we're overseas. There's a principle of talent over almost everything else that really changes the dynamic of, of the culture.、Uh, in such a culture, you must let people be different. So I have a pair of like pink bunny slippers in my office. I don't care if you wear pink bunny slippers to world headquarters. If you're the best in the world at what you do, like you got a place on my team. Embracing that. And being a place for the misfits is essential to 
going really fast and doing really great work, both on the creative side and the technology side. It need um, expertise from everywhere, essentially. You need talents from very different domains. So if you are the person, you love the reality more than the virtual. And if you as a person wanted to create a space for others, you want the world to be more fantastic in the future. I think join this industry. You have to keep learning, right? To embrace the, uh, the new era of software-defined vehicle, to embrace the new era of AI-defined vehicle. I know it's probably easier said than done. It's, it's, it's very difficult. But I do believe that in the next, um, you know, five to 10 years, this will definitely happen in the Western world as well. Mm -hmm.